Hello everyone, welcome back to the Japan Archives episode 57? I'm gonna say 57, it is now. It is 57, you're right. <laughs> it is, okay good. Well today is Heather's episode, so I'd say let's just jump straight into it, but I always must ask you how you are doing this week. That face says like you're not sure what's going on there. This has been, this week feels like it's been two or three weeks in one. I've had quite a few things go on. Also, I... I've, I've just started playing this game that someone has uh, <clears throat> got me involved in, and uh, my brain is now sort of being occupied by that a little bit. It was me. It was <laughs> so, so your fault. <laughs> so that and some other things, which I will talk about at some point, but we're not, not ready to talk about it yet on the podcast, but good. After all of that, I'm doing really good in spite of... Ahead. You know, isolation, cold, winter, coronavirus, mm. but hanging in there. How about yourself? Doing good this week. Well, as you know, I did have an interview, got through that. Now i got to wait for the second one. We'll see how it goes. we got my fingers crossed and my toes crossed and my eyes crossed. All the things crossed. Just about, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's me, basically. Not much, but tell me about noodles it's been a long time since a culinary history episode has happened and i have been sorely craving one for a while now you added there craving i thought you were gonna go i'm i'm hungry for one <laughs> so you you took a different direction <laughs> well i am going to satisfy your palate today with some noodly facts so it hasn't really been that long since a culinary episode. It feels like we haven't, but I think everything is kind of running together now. Like time is kind of... Exactly 10 episodes ago, you did sushi. Oh my goodness. Okay. Wow. It was still warm when I did sushi too. That was a while back. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so when I first thought of this topic, I I don't know why I thought it would be a little easier than it was. I, I, that, that was some of my naivete, naivete, naivete. Sure. That, that sounds ignorance. like a word. Uh -huh. Yeah. It was my, my ignorance in the knowledge of it, you know, being here, eating all kinds of different noodles. You don't always think about sometimes where it comes from. Or you hear something and you go, oh, yeah, that makes sense. But when thinking about it and looking at the noodles themselves, there's so many different types of noodles in Japan. And I got I got deeper into the research than I was expecting. And then I wanted to do, dive even more deeply into the research. But then again, our podcast is, you know, two hours long. And the fact that there are books and books and books and books written about noodles as well, to condense everything down is a little bit more difficult than I had anticipated. So, Okay, so there's a potential part two for noodles. Oh, we, we might go farther into that. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> but let me, let me go ahead and just start as my little bit of background about doing this research, but diving in. So... Thomas, if I mention to you Japan and noodles, what's the first thing you think of? Actually, two things, udon and soba. And you totally ruined my intro. Fantastic. I'm Thank so you. I'm so sorry. I'm so happy. <laughs> you made me so happy. I'm just, oh, oh. Wait, you're I, happy that I ruined the intro? Yes, because. Okay. Okay, I'm a little confused, but go on. That's okay. Welcome to my world. Well, if you mention if, you know, back before I moved here and before I had studied, you know, it more in depth into Japanese culture and history. Mm. And if you go like I what I think anyway, if you go if I go back to America and I ask people about, you know, Japan and noodles, what do you think? I think most people would say maybe ramen. Ramen okay. is so ingrained in, it's ingrained in American culture. So, you know, we have, for example, instant ramen. When I was a kid, we had, you know, just a few varieties. It's, it's definitely, the market has exploded for that in America. But 
instant, instant ramen was really popular. Everyone knew about it. College students adored it because it was so cheap. And along with sushi, that's probably one of the things that people most think about when you think about Japan, you think of sushi, ramen, sumo, and ninjas. Like those are the kind of the, the top, top things that kind of pop up. And mm -hmm. it's probably when we were thinking either about visiting or coming here to live, probably thought, oh my gosh, I can't wait to eat all of the ramen, so much ramen, because when you grow up eating instant ramen and you realize that real, like ramen is you know a dish that's made with like fresh ingredients and then you see it and then the first time you eat it, oh, it's just, it's like a revolution compared to, you know, especially if you get cup noodle to real ramen, it's mind blowing. When I was re starting to research and the topic, ramen is the article topic that came up the most frequently because not only is ramen a huge dish in Japan, it's all, all around the world. So like in the UK, do you guys have ramen shops? None spring to mind for a ramen shop. I know that we have sushi chains, but hmm. ramen train, ramen trains, ramen, ramen, ramen tra chains. I'm going to say I am not sure because mm. I'm sure someone will be listening and might be like, no, I know there are some. So I've personally never seen them. Or maybe I did, but didn't realize what they were at the time. But it's not, you know, it's not a big thing. Mm -hmm. English, English people love Italian restaurants. I bet in London, though, because London has like a London has a bit of everything. So there's bound to be something there. Okay. So again, like going a little off my topics, which is great because I always learn, love learning new stuff because mm -hmm. I do know that in America, like I watch, I watched and I still do, I watch a lot of food programming. So like travel programs and food bloggers that go different places and ramen, ramen, ramen. It's everywhere. It's each any specific countries have specific ways they do it and i know in yeah. new york and in Cal several places in california have tons of different ramen shops and even like the the city that i used to live in they got a, ra a couple ramen shops which you know when it kind of gets out more towards the you know smaller cities then it's definitely become a big thing it would be really easy to just focus on ramen for this episode but I think we're going to have to come back and do a whole episode on ramen because doing the research, I found out some really interesting things about ramen. And in fact, there are books written about ramen as well. So I am going to have to read them and mm. like ramen and its um, place in Japanese history. There's a lot of different aspects to it that are pretty fascinating. And I'll find the book and I'll tell you, and I feel like you would really enjoy reading it because it's ramen and in relation to history. But do you like ramen? I do like ramen. And um, there was a like very, very good vegetable ramen that you can get at Shibuya. And in like a little basement hidden away. Mm -hmm. I used oh. to go with Tessa. She showed it me, actually. I would recommend it. And we ate that vegetable ramen one time. It was at was Kyoto? Ooh, yeah, in the random mall we went in. That was also a very good ramen. That was the first time I had vegetarian ramen, and it was mm. fantastic. It's hard to find vegetarian ramen in Japan. Yeah. But when you do find it, it's always very, very good. Mm. There are so many different types of noodles in Japan. And they are while, while, while ramen gets most of the love, they are all equally delicious in their own way. So we're going to mm -hmm. mention ramen a little bit in this episode, but I'm going to give a little bit of background and information about other noodles as well. So you mentioned too, you know, soba and udon. What other noodles do you know? Aside from ramen, the only other one I can think of, I'm not sure what the Japanese would be, but they're called glass noodles. Okay, good. Um, but that's pretty much it for me. Soba, udon, glass noodles, and ramen. Oh, goody. So then you, you didn't mention one that I'm going to start with, which is salmon. So have you had salmon before? Tell me what it is, and I'll let you know. Solmen is actually the thinnest noodle, I think, in Japan. It's very light. It's usually served cold. Oh, and I have seen it. You can get those a lot at the kombinis. Oh, you're talking about the packaged ones? Yes. That might be... 
Oh, actually, I think they do have somen in the summer because usually somen is a summer food because right. it is you, it's served chilled sometimes with with um on top of ice or has actual ice cubes in it to keep it cold because mm. somen because it's so light and thin and in the summertime it's really hot and you usually don't have an appetite here because it's so hot and it's so humid but you have to eat so it's considered like a light dish and with a chilled dish it's very easy and delicate to eat so that you can have something on your stomach without feeling too full okay these noodles this was interesting when i was i was doing some research these noodles possibly have origins from the nada period and came to japan from china but these noodles these these origin noodles were called somochi and they were made from rice flour and not from wheat flour okay so in the kamakura period though noodles were starting to be made from wheat instead of rice and these wheat-based noodles were served at buddhist temples in the muromachi period and it's probably around this time that we get that name transition to somen i'm wondering why they've made the change from rice to wheat because rice is a much bigger thing in Japan than wheat. You're rubbing your hands. I feel like I've stumbled across something here. Oh, I'm, I'm so excited. So here, do you see what's happening? When I start talking about noodles, you start thinking about, oh, when did wheat get to Japan? Uh-huh. And then that took me down another rabbit hole, a really fascinating one, because wheat was, I think from around in my research, I think it was around the, the Nada period that there was mention of wheat possibly there could have been something sooner but the mentioning of it in a historical text was about that time and i do know it was grown i think in hokkaido and in one other region the name escapes me at the moment but it wasn't a huge part of the japanese diet because i'm going to ask you a culinary question <laughs> by the way okay all right you know wheat it grows in a field it is Kind of like you know, it has like a, it's a, it's kind of, it's grass, I think, and mm -hmm. you have the 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 wheat germ itself and the wheat grain. How do you actually get flour from wheat? This was like an elementary question. <laughs> I'm sorry. You get the flour from the wheat. You have to grind it down in the flour mill. Yes, you are right. That was. I'm feel. I feel like a teacher right now. That's right, Thomas. <laughs> so the the grinding. Yeah, there wasn't really a way to grind it. So they didn't use it so much because it probably required, you know, someone having to maybe hand mill it. Even though the technology existed elsewhere in the world, Japan didn't use millstones or windmills or grindstones and things at the time. I mean, it does make sense if they don't have the crop, then why would you be utilizing such buildings and technology like the rest of the world? If you're a rice based culture, then. You don't, exactly. You don't grind rice except for when you're making like, you know, mochi or basically mochi. So, yeah. So so that, yeah, that's another whole other topic for another episode talking about like wheat coming into Japan. So that's around the Kamakura period, though. And I did mention this in another, actually, I think it was in Udon. So we'll come back to milling and wheat with Japan. But we're going to keep on with, so with Solman, but thank you so much for asking that question. I was kind of hoping you would because I had touched on the research, but I just couldn't fit it all in. Oh, so excited. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> so Solman is actually given as a gift here. So one of the traditions I've heard, when you move to a new place, you can present your neighbors with Solman. In the summertime too, you know, and there's two big gift giving seasons here so in this in the summer and in the winter you've probably seen the gift sets at the at the at the mall and things yeah giving somen is a really popular present to give a big pack of somen and um it's really good i've actually gotten somen as a gift before and i always appreciate that somen itself it, it says it's a thin noodle and it's stretched out as well if you've ever okay. gotten a chance to see it being made, like a lot of the the um, educational shows that we watch on on Japanese TV will show like noodle makers and some of the techniques they use for like the the craftsmen who make the the different noodles, not just the you know the factories, but the the people who actually handcraft um, like somen 
it's a fascinating process. They can like stretch them out and they dry them for a while before they, they cut and package them. Oh, one more thing I want to mention about Soman, which you probably know about this one. Nagash Soman. Have you heard of this before? Nagash Soman. I'm going to assume no, because, well, you asked me about the different types of noodles that I knew about, and Soman wasn't on the list, so. But you might not have realized that this was Soman. Have you ever seen people take, like, there's like a long bamboo tube, and there's water flowing, and then you see people with their chopsticks take and grab noodles? I have seen videos of that. I you know, I thought that was glass noodles, but I'm clearly mixing up the two here. So that is also a type of Soman. That's that is Soman. So okay. Soman is sit down that floating bamboo tube. And there's some restaurants that do this. One time one of my schools we we did this. So it was really fun. It's harder than it's really hard. I actually had <laughs> students helping me out to try to get the noodles. But because there's, you know, a little bit of a pandemic going on. So I don't recommend you go to a restaurant now and you probably can't even do Nagash Soman, but you can in your very own home buy your own personal Nagash Soman machine that you can enjoy the experience without the possible contamination. I wonder how much those machines are. They range in price. I think I've seen them for about like a thousand yen, which is roughly $10 up into like Oh, $40, okay. 4,000 yen around. I'm surprised. I I look at them every summer and kind of go, could we, could we get one? And the professor goes, no, we don't need it. We won't use it. And I kind of <laughs> want to try it, but it, it feels like it's more, more if you have kids, I feel like that might be something entertaining to do with them in the summer. Yeah, very true. So yeah, you knew Selman. You just didn't know it was Selman, but you've seen it. So yay. You know more than you knew. So we're going to leave Soman and go to another S, which you already mentioned, which is Soba. Okay. And actually, can you tell me about Soba? The other things I can tell you is that it's made of buckwheat. What color is Soba? Oh, let me check. Are you put grayish? No, no, I, I agree with that. It's kind of a, it's a very specific, but gray Play-Doh. <gasps> It's a very <laughs> specific type of gray, but it may, reminds me of that color. And, oh, I love that. Thank you. Oh my gosh, thank you. I was, I, I, I was say, I literally, when I was typing, I paused and went, what color? It's, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a nondescript color. It's a gray, but a, not a stereotypical gray. Mm. <laughs> Non-stereotypical gray. These guys, uh, so you, you, you love Soba. And I think actually, if I'm not mistaken, you've done Wanko Soba? I did with Tessa when I lived in Morioka. We tried to do the challenges. Can you have 100 tiny cups of soba? We didn't do it, but I think I got up to like 80 or something. I almost made it, but it was, oh, it's a lot. That's a lot of noodles. I give you, I give you mad respect for getting eighty bowls. I don't mm. think I could do it. Do you? First, it's delicious, and then it just becomes like a chore. You kind of have to just. Well, they're very tiny mouthfuls, but overall, it becomes a lot. So, my logic was when to try and trick my brain into think I was eating less instead of eating it one bowl at a time. I would put all ten in my mouth and then eat it. <laughs> That's a great strategy. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, you mentioned that they are from buckwheat. And do you know what buckwheat is? Because I didn't know. I just looked this up and I this was really cool. No, it's one of those things. I was just brought up being told buckwheat. And I was just, I always just imagined like a different form of wheat. But I, I guess it's not quite that. Yeah, I was surprised too. I thought it was like a wheat or a grass. It, it's mm -hmm. not. It's actually related to like sorrel and rhubarb. Okay, so we're moving away from wheat. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we're away. Um, but yeah, I was right there with you when I looked it up because I, I had never thought, what is buckwheat? I'm trying to understand the logic behind the name, but I guess there might not be. I think when I, I actually, I put the link in for this too about the like the origins or the, mm -hmm. the knowledge of buckwheat is that it's considered a cereal grain, which is what wheat is. Wheat's a cereal grain, but it's considered a cereal grain, but it's not a cereal grain, but it's 
Right. So I think maybe that's where the the wheat kind of came in. So these noodles came over from China during the Jomon period, Mm. which is sometime between 10,000 and 300 BC. So that's quite a, not discrepancy, a questionable time period they could come have come in. They could have come right at the start. They could have come in the middle. They haven't pinned down a smaller period of time in the Jomon. During my research, I saw possibly towards the latter, so possibly okay. towards towards that 300 BC mark, but I would have to do a little bit more research into buckwheat and soba. Buckwheat itself has a lot of nutritional value. I read mm. something that has a lot of B vitamins, and it's considered, as far as noodle go, noodles go, you're pretty healthy, but there are people who have allergies to buckwheat and can't eat it. Okay. So... I mean, the people do have wheat allergies too, but I think that there's, a, I'm not sure if buckwheat or wheat allergies are higher on the list of allergies, but it's definitely, a, it's a top allergen. I do know some people have said they have allergies to buckwheat and can't eat it. And interestingly enough, people, I know my friends who have wheat allergies can sometimes eat buckwheat. Right. But you have to be careful because sometimes soba now is made with both buckwheat and wheat flour. So you have to really pay attention to the packaging to see which one you're going to get. So if sober is also being made now with wheat, the the name sober isn't determined on what it's made of. Well, it's still still made with buckwheat. So I think that's Uh, the... It's still part, but as long as buckwheat is in there, no matter how small the amount, it's sober. Okay. Hmm. And I think that might have to do something, have something to do with like cost cutting perhaps, because... Interestingly enough, this morning I was watching like our local news and they were showing in Hokkaido farmers getting buckwheat grains, but they had submerged it, put them in, in large bags and submerged the bags in water. So they were draining the buckwheat and then putting them out on drying racks in the sun. Now this, this is in Hokkaido. There was snow everywhere. These poor men were reaching into the water, into the very cold water, with gloves to pull out these soaking sacks of buckwheat. Why? I thank you. That's exactly what I said. So now I'm going to have to look into how do you make buckwheat flour? And I didn't have time to research that. So that's another topic we could probably talk about. Hmm. Okay. Anything else about sober? Or are we ready to move on to our, the next one? I've got a couple more things about soba. Okay. I talked about how to eat somen, but mm. you li- you like soba. How do you eat soba? I'm gonna ask you instead of me saying everything. I would, you know all the stuff, a lot of the stuff too. So, like, how do you when you ate the soba in um, Morioka? Is it in Morioka that the the wanko soba is? Or well, when they served it in there, it was there was a person with a with a bucket of it, and you had your <laughs> little you had your little dish like super tiny dish and like you'd have one and she'd be ready with the ladle to fill it up straight away because you're supposed to eat it super quick. Maybe my experience of sober is slightly different in that it was in a very small dish, like one mouthful, and then instantly you were given another one. But it was a wanko soba eating challenge, not just going out for sober. Well, there's a couple of ways you can eat soba. You can have it hot or you can have it cold. Okay. Hot is with a dashi stock, usually, although we're going to touch on regional things eventually as well. Or if you have it cold, you have a little little dish of like minsuyu, which is a, a kind of a dipping sauce made from like, um, I think the one I have is like an instant one where you just add a little bit of water to it, but it has like soy sauce, mirin, sake, mm. bonito, I think bonito stock. So a dashi, a bonito dashi stock. And you also have like chopped, like sliced green onions and wasabi served as well. So you can take all of your green onions and put in the minsuyu. You can take a little wasabi put in there or like me, a whole bunch of wasabi and put in there because I love wasabi with my minsuyu. Oh, wasabi is the best. And then you take the cold soba and you dip it and you slurp it. One more thing to mention about soba which you might have heard, you might not have heard, actually literally may have heard. Sometimes when you hear people eat soba, 
you hear a loud slurping sound. Yes. There's kind of a reason for that. So oddly enough, I mean, in Japan, table manners, you know, very respectful. You have certain ways to, to hold things, certain ways to do things. You don't leave your chopsticks standing up. You don't leave your chops yep. just laying on the table. You don't eat out of someone else's bowl, <laughs> those things like that. But with soba and other noodles too, slurping is totally okay. And it's actually encouraged. Which is surprising. You go to like a soba restaurant and you hear all of these people slurping. At first, it's like, what's going on? So it's kind of showing that, showing politeness that you're, you're being noisy because it's delicious. Well, I encountered another article about this. Okay. The reason, one of the reasons why, so yeah, appreciation for the food. Also, because uh, especially cold soba you can't really smell it so much. It doesn't have such a mm. strong smell, but you want to appreciate the dish with, you know, with your whole, whole face, you know, you appreciate it with your eyes, you appreciate it with your nose and appreciate it with your mouth. Mm. So that slurping kind of gives you another sensation, like almost like a, a different sense, almost like cars between like smelling and tasting in mm. a in a way, I'm probably describing it very poorly and the article is much better, which I am including <laughs> in the show notes, but it gives you that a, a deeper appreciation for eating that soba. And it's really hard to slurp. Like, can you slurp noodles? Because I, I know that it's a thing in Japan, but being British, it's very, you know, you, you don't noisily eat your food. Mm -mm. You're supposed to eat it quietly because that's polite. So mm -hmm. I don't mind it here because that is what happens. But personally, I don't do it. I wouldn't do it. Have you tried it? It is difficult. Oh, my God. It's so difficult. Uh, th there's clearly an art form to it that I don't possess. It's I don't possess the grace to eat noodles noisily. And I've, I've tried to practice to practice at home. I don't practice out at restaurants because it just makes a mess. But <laughs> but I do try because the professor can do it. I mean, he's just like a natural at it. And I try it and it makes him laugh so much because I feel like a vacuum cleaner. Like trying, I'm not going to make the sounds at the respect <laughs> for everyone listening. <laughs> but it feels like like trying to suck up like a, like a, like a vacuum. <laughs> it's just... Mm. So I just, yeah, I'm with you. Like growing up, if I had made any, you know, open, uh, smack your food or clang your your silverware on your teeth, oh, you get in trouble. So yeah. it's so hard to break that that habit of trying to be noisy to eat your food when you've been taught don't be noisy when you eat your food. And now we finish with soba. <laughs> okay. So we're gonna move on to the other noodle you mentioned, which is udon. Udon is a thicker noodle. Yeah. I have to, I'm, I'm going back in my memory. I know there's one person I know, at least, that does not like udon. Do you like udon? Mm -hmm. So how did you eat your udon? It was a big bowl. I think it was curry udon. Oh. Um, like I said, the noodles are very thick. You eat it with chopsticks. But I did struggle to pick them up with the chopsticks because of how chunky and heavy they are. They are heavy noodles. Mm -hmm. Mm. So I struggled, but I did my best. Well, I've never had curry udon out at a restaurant. I've tried to do it at home, but though I did it for like my lunch one day and I sent a picture to the, prof to the professor and he went, uh, that's that's not quite curry udon. That was like, I enjoyed it. It was delicious. So I need to have real curry udon. Yeah. Okay. So you've had udon. Oh my goodness. Looking into udon got me to another little rabbit hole because there are some possible origin stories for udon and they're really interesting. And now we have to, we have to look into udon more because okay. one of them. So this is very much a History of all noodles, and then we're going to have future specific noodle episodes, I feel. I am totally happy to talk about, you know, I love, I love noodles. It's one of my, uh -huh. one of my weaknesses, which is why I try not to eat them too often because mm. it's a weakness. But yeah, and also now you'll get to try all of these things, and then you can also chime in and say, oh, I like to eat my noodles this way. So the origin, possibly, one says that a monk... Name Enni 
brought over a wheat milling technique from China around 1421. Okay. So this goes back to us talking about millstones and things. So possibly that's when this finally started. Yeah. So that, that whole, I did find some other research that I started looking into, but it was so in depth and so detailed that I had to leave it for another day. But this, this wheat milling technique allowed the production of more widespread noodle making because before if you had to right. you know, it possibly hand grind i'm thinking about like the little the mortal and pestle so i suppose before with the mortar and pestle it was more they had the means to do it but it was more very localized small amounts being made but potentially this allowed more to be made meaning it could be eaten further mm -hmm. away because there was more processed yeah i would, I would imagine too because it probably was such a labor intensive process to make make the noodles themselves I, I would imagine that mostly um higher stationed people would be eating these as opposed to you know the people who were like laboring like the farmers and the craftsmen who may not have been able to afford to to do it so now with this i feel like possibly it opened up to more people to be able to eat noodles but that's that's a research for another day another origin story said that a monk another monk named Kukai, introduced the noodles to Sanaki province, which do you know where Sanaki province is? I barely know where half the prefectures are in Japan. Now you're asking for provinces which haven't existed for a long time. Um, I'm just going to say no. Rip okay. off the band-aid. Nope, don't know this one either. It's Shikoku, which I just learned this too. <laughs> Strangely though, I have heard the name Sanuki before. But I did not know it was a province, and I didn't know it was Shikoku, but I'd heard the name before. Where from? Udon. I'd heard it in oh, relation to... Okay. <laughs> that not makes sense. To... It does, but I never put those two together. Then I went, oh, oh, oh my gosh, that's okay, cool. So... The light bulb moment. <laughs> it really was. Now, you mentioned Kukai. Yeah, yeah. Do you remember him? Oh my god, refresh me, refresh me. He is... Also, for the listeners, does this name ring a bell? He, we've mentioned him once, ever so briefly, and we said, oh, we'll give him an episode at some point. He is one of the people who is thought to have maybe written the Iroha poem that we did. Oh, my gosh. So not only has this man supposedly brought noodles into Japan, he also was the one who potentially wrote the Iroha poem, which was the Pangram. Which is kind of cool. It I don't know, maybe they've kind of latched onto this man. It's like, we have another unsolved mystery. Must have been Kukai, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's some, some of the origins. Was it Udon or Ramen? No, I think Ramen had one of the shogunats involved somehow as a possible origin. And it just, it gets really, yeah, I think sometimes a popular person, like, oh, of course they introduced it. Well, this uh, for, for Kukai, he, he studied in China during the Heian era. So mm. it is possible that these noodles were brought over from with Kukai from China. So there is possibly like a, a Chinese origin for these noodles as well. So it's kind of like he brought them back. Everyone liked them. So they decided, let's adopt the technique so we can mass produce it because we like it so much. That, and that's why I want to go and look more into it because like looking at the origin of Udon was quite, quite interesting. I didn't realize they had had such a long history either. So mm -hmm. they've been, you know, Soba and Solmen have had you know, quite a long history. Yeah. Now these are made from wheat flour and they are kneaded and I think stretched and cut. And yes, they are thick, chewy noodles. So kind of like a, a square shaped noodle. And these are, these are delicious. They're, they're great. Like you said, they're, there are lots of ways to enjoy them besides the curry udon, which is kitsune udon, which is a light stock served with a free, sweet fried tofu on top. I think sometimes wakame seaweed and like green onions. And it's really cheap too, by the way. What did they do to the tofu, did you say? It is it's a fried tofu and it's sweetened. Ah, I think that's why it's called kitsune. I think the frying mm -hmm. and the stuff they put on top colors it into the reminiscent of a fox. Yeah, actually, a cooking technique. Um, if you if you ever, when you do Japanese cooking techniques, there, Thomas, 
um, which someday I will convince you to do. Kitsune Brown is a cooking technique. So when you're deep frying something, it will say in the, the recipes to cook it to that Kitsune color, which is a fox color, which is that light golden brown. So like golden brown mm. and delicious color. That's cool. Of kitsune udon, which is also really cheap. I think I said that, but I don't remember, so I'm getting back on track. And udon itself too can be similar to soba or somen. You can eat them like a kind of cold or served in. A, I've seen a wooden bowl or a, a small bowl, and then dipped mm. into stock or minsuyu or hot, where you have a. Apparently, there's different stock styles depending on where you're based in Japan. The one I'm most familiar with, and actually I love, I love udon. And back when I could go out to restaurants, one of the, one of my favorite places to eat udon is a chain restaurant called Marogame. And it has like the light broth, which I think is Western Japan. I think in Eastern Japan, it's like a darker, more soy sauce broth. But I think Marogame udon is, is a Kansai possibly Kansai. I've got to research that more too. But it's, uh, you essentially order your udon, then you can get tempura. You can choose different tempura. And then at the end, there's a big machine and you dispense out as much of the hot dashi stock as you like in your bowl. Does sound delicious. So I, I'm going to challenge you either before I get to Tokyo, which who knows when that will be, or when <laughs> you guys can go out to eat again, which I don't know if that's going to be the same time or not, but we'll go to Maragame Udon and you have to try it. It's so good and it's really inexpensive. You can get it for like, you can get like a bowl of Udon for like what, less than three and a half dollars. One other one I'm going to mention, which I didn't mention with soba and I can't believe I didn't men mention soba. Yaki Udon, because there's yaki soba, but yaki Udon, you can also fry the Udon and it's delicious. It's so good. And... I've seen udon noodles in Okonomiyaki, at least here in Hiroshima Prefecture, where uh, noodles oh, are okay. included in Okonomiyaki. So yeah, in Tokyo, you guys probably just have, I think it's just cabbage and the pancake and the sauce. But in Western Japan, noodles are often included or are included in Okonomiyaki. It's like mixed into the Okonomiyaki or like placed on top or? It is layered, layered usually, I think on the bottom. All right. At least the ones I've had in Hiroshima Prefecture. So yeah, because there's Hiroshima Okonomiyaki, there's Osaka Okonomiyaki, there's like Tokyo Okonomi Okonomiyaki, and then every region has their own. It it gets it gets complicated, and that's where I'm going to leave udon for now. <laughs> there's other stuff okay. to talk about, but <laughs> we're going to roll along. We've got two noodles left. <laughs> we have two, and now I focused on wheat noodles, but like you mentioned, the glass noodles. If your mm -hmm. definition of noodles includes anything that is long and thin. Well, then I'm going to briefly mention harusame. Harusame are glass noodles, and they are made from starch, including like potato or mung bean starch. So there's other hmm. different starches that can be used as well. Now, these noodles are different because you hydrate these noodles in hot water, or you can add them to nabe, for example, which we've done with kimchi nabe, which is delicious. And you can use them in salads, or you can put them in spring rolls and among other uses. So have you had glass noodles before? No, that's the thing. I know of them because I'm kind of fascinated by them. They mm. look really interesting and I, I really want to try them. Just never got around to it yet. Actually, there's a really good Korean recipe for the hot, the glass noodles. It's japchae. Mm. It's, really, it's really easy to make. And it's so good. I recommend, really recommend making japchae. They're not expensive either. Harusame noodles are not expensive. So finally, finally, and there's other noodles. I did not include all the noodles. There are other ones, but we're going to keep in these. Let's get to ramen. We're going to end with ramen, but and it's going to be so brief. This is going to be very brief. Ramen noodles are made from wheat and water, but there's something special about ramen noodles as opposed to the mm. other ones, which are wheat, salt, water. They have to be made with kansui, which is an alkaline water. If, okay. they are, if they aren't made with this with this water, they can't be called ramen. At least that's what I've been told. I have been told specifically because one time I said, oh, I don't have any ramen noodles, but I could use other noodles. That's not ramen. Okay. I understand. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, 
They have to be made in a certain way. Interestingly enough, there was a, I think I've mentioned this before back, call back to episode 39, Arctic Expedition, where I mentioned the movie Chef of South Pole, where ah, they, yeah. mm. they ran out of ramen noodles and they were very upset. They were highly upset. And the chef came up with a technique to make ramen noodles from scratch. And everyone was so happy. It's like they had seen the sun come out, which mm. interestingly enough, because in the Arctic, there is a period where there's no sun. So to see for them to see the sun come out in these, this bowl of ramen noodles, it was a really great moment to mm. have that appreciation for ramen. Now, these noodles are also thought to have come from China, but not that long ago in relative Japanese noodle history. So I think it was around the 19th century, so around the 1800s or so. So they're they're actually a pretty short period of time. I do want to mention about ramen is that there are different popular base types that you might know, which is shoyu, soy sauce based ramen, tonkotsu or tonkotsu, which is the pork broth based. I think like pork, even like pork bones, I think are involved in that one, if I'm not mistaken. Shio, which is a salt based broth and miso which is miso-based broth. And then Hokkaido ramen, which, what's something about Hokkaido that you might know? Like what, what popular product comes from Hokkaido? Wow, funnily enough, I'm seeing more and more Hokkaido products in the supermarkets these days. Mm. You got all your milk and things now. So I guess milk-based products, they have a lot of good cows up there. You got your watermelons, they always come from Hokkaido. I was going to say apples, but I stopped myself because that's Aomori. Mm. But no, I would I would say like they're dairy products or they're watermelons. But I'm trying to figure out how that relates to ramen. Oh, perfect, because yeah, you mentioned dairy products, butter. Ah, oh, okay. Mm. Is made with miso, butter, and corn. So they're adding the butter and corn as extra ingredients. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. So putting some, uh, which is actually re really good. I mean, it makes it. A little heavier, a little you know, because ramen itself is it's not a light dish. There's a lot of there's a lot of grease involved in in ramen, yeah, yeah, yeah. So adding the extra butter, but it's still it's good. It, don't eat it all the time, but definitely if you get a chance to eat Hokkaido ramen and it's a good one, oh, it's it's good. I mean, I mentioned the base base flavors, um, but if you go anywhere in Japan, town, city, prefecture, mm. area, everyone has got their own specific style of ramen and it's a special kind it's a special type it is way too numerous to talk about here and even i think even talking about it when we do an episode about ramen we're not going to be able to cover all of them but going to the different prefectures and trying their specialty ramen is something that a lot of people when they travel do try to do and not just ramen but all of the other noodles <laughs> pretty much have regional specialties too so again we can't touch all of them right now but we'll kind of come back to them again so there we go there's a short long intro to noodles in japan and there are so many different people who like you know chefs and food bloggers and everything who go around and travel in japan or even you know i know in america go to different ramen places and try different ramen and try different noodles so definitely if you haven't seen them check them out uh and as a side note just to finish up if you're wondering Yes, I did have to eat noodles while I was writing this research. In fact, I had udon today at lunch, which I think is my favorite. Although I do like somen and I do like soba, but I need further research before I can confirm my favorite noodle. Well, we will definitely have to come back to this topic at some point because in Morioka alone, where I live, they had three regional noodles. Banko soba, which you've mentioned, jajamen, as well as uh, reimen, which is kind of interesting. It was a cold type of noodle, which comes with watermelon in it. What? So it was very, very special. But that's all I'm going to say. We'll have to talk about regional ones at a later date, like you said. Um, you know, we can we can talk about the ones specific to where we live, I guess or where we have lived, at the very least. That mm. might be interesting. Mm -hmm. <sighs> but thank you, that was a lot. And I enjoyed it. <laughs> I was like, oh, I do noodles. And then noodles just, it snowballed into something noodles else. Noodles so. just got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. 
I'm so happy. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Now I have to ask you, we've said a lot about noodles, but I have found a noodle poem if you still wish to have a poem section today. If I say yes, is that bad? No, not. So the poem today, it's a... It's from around the 1700s, eight, early 1800s. Uh, the man who wrote it was born in 1763 and died in 1828. And we have talked about him before. You talked yeah. about him all the way back in episode number seven. Our little man whose pen name was a cup of tea, Kobayashi <gasps> Isa. A very long time since we've talked about him. So Yay! I just, I wanted to just mention when he was born and died. We, you know, if you want a reminder of who he was, you can check out episode seven or I will have to check our website. I'm not sure yet if we have a wiki page dedicated to him. Maybe we do. If not, it's on my to-do list. But anyway, he has done a noodle poem. If you wish to try and translate it. Oh no, yes. <laughs> if you're ready, do you need a pen and paper or are you good? Oh, I have both of these very close to me, so yes. Okay. Nice. Yes. So if you are ready. Mm, Kagero ya sobaya ga mae no hashi no yama. I feel like the first line I'm I'm not recognizing. I feel like if I see it written out, I might somewhat somewhat know, but the, the last two lines I think I might have picked up. So you had the, the soba yaga. So it sounds like a soba restaurant, possibly. And okay. then you've got your chopsticks. Was it Hashi no yama? Mm -hmm. So I don't know why I'm getting the visual of either a, a large pile of soba or the somehow your chopsticks being on the soba to look like a mountain. So something about being in a soba restaurant and either your food or your presentation looks like a mountain. Okay, you're kind of getting there. So the the first, the first line, which you weren't sure about, I I also wouldn't have known. The kanji does help a bit, but it so it goes, In the heat haze, before the noodle shop lies, a mountain of chopsticks. Ah, that's amazing. That's right, I, I forgot the maino. Uh, so my no, so in front of the soba shop. Oh my goodness, that's really cool. <laughs> and yeah, it would make sense like in the summer, like eating eating soba because it's kind of a lighter food if it's the chilled soba too. Ah, phenomenal. I love that so much. I'm glad. So the the chopsticks being like a mountain, I don't know if we, we I, this is something else I wanted to look at for the research, which is like, you know, the restaurants uh, in Japan, like origin of all the restaurants and things. I know that there was carts for soba, but as far as like soba restaurants, I'm, a, I, I'm not sure if the chopsticks were in that time were disposable or if they were reusable. And I'm guessing if you have, instead of having like, you know, cleaning service, they just kind of leave things and then wash them up at the end of the night or something like that. So that's really interesting. That I mean, do you know anything about that? I don't. I'm not sure about the disposable chopsticks thing. I do feel though that that is a modern, in mm. not invention, but a modern thing. Mm. I feel that back then it was way more cost effective for these small establishments and things to have things that they could reuse again and mm. again. So probably yeah. not disposable. So there was a mountain of chopsticks, whether they were used or whether they were there ready to be used. I don't know. Mm. Maybe there were two. Maybe there was a used and unused one. But I like that you mentioned the carts. I remember that from the sushi episode that everything used to be on little carts until Tokyo burnt down and then they moved into shops. Hmm. I also thought people, didn't people travel with their chopsticks? Oh, they, they so, probably had like their nice own pair of chopsticks that they took everywhere with them. Hmm. But maybe if you went to a restaurant, you would just use what the restaurant had instead of taking your own because you have to wash them and all that stuff. China and Japan and... Korea, South Korea, and other places have different styles of chopsticks. Okay. Mm -hmm. Japan's are tapered, China's are not, and mm. South Korea has metal. That does make sense. When I go to Koreatown, they do use more metal chopsticks. Mm -hmm. I can't use them. I'm really terrible at metal They're chopsticks. too heavy. They're too heavy to use. Well, 
Thomas, I wish I had something insightful to say, but other than I really love that poem and I'm so glad you find it, but that's my insight is thank you. I feel that, I feel that this one, there's not much of a discussion. I know the others before there's been interpretation and things, but it was just a nice, short, sweet poem about, you know, being at a noodle shop, which hmm. I thought was nice and related. And it was nice, I, you know, calls back to Kobayashi Isa. It's been so hmm. long since we've had a poem by him. I've, I've looked at so many poems by him and then chosen somebody else and I always feel bad. I'm like, I'm coming back to you. I'm coming back to you. But it's good. We have callbacks now and then, but finding new poets as, as well is also our main aim. But no, I'm glad you liked it. And once more again, thank you for all the noodle facts today. It was very interesting. You are so very welcome. It, it, yeah, this was, a, this was great today. Just culinary history, the culinary history of the culinary history of mm -hmm. everything. <laughs> If that's about it, then uh, thank you everyone for tuning in today. We really appreciate it. Next week, you know, I think we should do the Pokemon. I think it would be interesting. It means we'll get to jump around and learn like a few quick facts about different places and people about Japanese history. I think that would be quite cool to do. I don't think we'll be able to do all of the Pokemon. There's what, like a, mi a million of them at this point. I've lost track. But we'll we'll pick a few that are interesting and things you know as a good starting point hmm. i'm gonna assume that you won't be able to find a poem about pokemon so feel free to find whatever <laughs> you like next week <laughs> you know i started thinking i'm like how can i relate and find something maybe maybe you okay. could sing the song of the pokemon theme tune no i'm kidding you don't have oh, to it's probably my... copyright it's copyrighted <laughs> but that would be Awesome. I can sing, sing in Japanese. <laughs> yeah, that would be kind of cool, but unfortunately, probably can't do that. Probably can't. That's but once bad. more, thank you guys for tuning in today. Show notes will eventually be up on the website, historyjapan.co.uk. Follow us on Twitter and on Facebook at Japan Archives. And if you want to see some of the places I've visited in Japan, you can follow my Instagram, nexus underscore travel. I haven't uploaded that much recently because you know we're not going anywhere but hopefully soon things Great will happen <laughs> yeah i think that's all for me thank you again heather for this week and yeah yeah that's... <laughs> that's, i'm like yeah i think i've said enough today i'm tired <laughs> 